Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning again. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Luigi Del Puerto. I'm the associate publisher and editor of the Arizona Capital Times. Uh, if you don't have a subscription to the Arizona Capital Times, let me know. Please let me know. That's the best gift you can give yourself this summer. Um, we have a lot to discuss this morning. But first, I want to thank our sponsors. The 336 mile long Central Arizona project is a monument to long term, long term thinking in Arizona. In the early 20th century, our leaders knew the state's future depended on a water supply that was secure, stable, and renewable. They pursued that vision, and today, the canal delivers Colorado River water to central and southern Arizona, and it is the state's single largest source of water supply, serving 80% of our uh, population. Uh, so thank you again to the Central Arizona Project. Um, please welcome Lisa Atkins, board president of the Central Arizona Project, for uh, short uh, intro remarks. Good morning, Luigi. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me a couple of minutes to welcome you to an annual event that we're very proud to participate in. I'm sure that several of my board colleagues have logged in today, and on behalf of all of the board, I'd like to welcome you to the Morning Scoop and to thank the Arizona Capital Times for hosting this annual discussion. Of course, it goes without saying that 2020 has been quite a year. However, there's one thing you haven't had to worry about, and that's the consistent and reliable flow of water. I'm proud of the essential workers at CAP and across Arizona's water industry who have continued to work tirelessly to ensure continued access to our most precious resource, water. Today, you may hear more about the role water has played with regard to COVID. The discussion may also update you on drought contingency plan that occupied much of our focus in 2018 and 2019. And one key takeaway, I hope, is that all that effort was worth it. DCP is already doing its job to stabilize the decline of Lake Mead. And finally, you'll likely hear more about our next step, the Arizona Reconsultation Committee, which builds upon the DCP collaboration and will define the Arizona perspective as we move forward renegotiations within the Colorado River Basin. So enjoy today's program. I'm sure you're le you will learn a lot, as I will. Stay healthy and stay safe. Thanks, Luigi. Thank you, Lisa. And um, I want to also thank SRP uh, for sponsoring this discussion. SRP, of course, provides reliable, affordable water and power to more than 2 million people in a 2,900 square mile service area that spans uh, three Arizona counties, including most of the Phoenix metro area. It's water. Uh, business is one of the largest raw water suppliers in the state, delivering 800,000 acre feet of water annually to a 375 square mile service area and manages a, I'm sorry, an SRP also manages a 13,000 square mile watershed that includes an extensive system of reservoirs, wells, canals, and irrigation laterals. Here to also welcome us is Megan Martin, the Senior Government Relations Representative for SRP. Morning, Luigi, and thank you for everyone being here this morning to tune in. I'm happy to be here representing SRP, and I'm looking forward to hearing from this distinguished panel. SRP is pleased to be a sponsor this morning. As a region's largest provider of raw water, and as Arizonans ourselves, we care deeply about the wise management, use, and conservation of our most vital resource. The good news is that because of the decades of planning and work we have done with our partners, many of whom are with us today, we are well positioned to maintain a reliable and resilient water supply long into the future. That's true even when considering the possible effects of climate change, but it will take more than collaboration and hard work to ensure we will meet and hopefully exceed our water goals. The broad diversity of our water resources is a tremendous advantage. We have surface water, underground aquifers, water stored underground for future pumping, Colorado River water through the CAP, and reclaimed wastewater. And much of the magic happens through the management of water throughout the system of dams and resources, which our experts choreograph to balance water supplies for use today and into the future. This system is our insurance policy against challenges such as drought. If you'd like to know more about how water gets from the watershed to your shower head, I encourage you to check out the special video series we produced in partnership with Arizona PBS that's now available to 70,000 educators. You can find it on the SRP YouTube page or you can let me know and I can send you a link. The man who knows how all 
knows best how all of this works is Dave Roberts, SRP Associate General Manager for Water Resources. And he's one of the panelists this morning and our water guru. And that means I'm gonna wrap it up and let Dave and the other panelists lead the discussion. I appreciate this opportunity and thank you for participating in this important dialogue. Thank you, Megan. And also sponsoring this uh, morning scoop is the city of Phoenix, which has been delivering clean, reliable water supply to homes uh, business industries and other customers for more than 100 years. Its successes have come from engaging customers, of course, in planning for water supply needs and promoting the responsible use of water. More than 90% of the water delivered to customers comes from surface, air, uh, surface water sources, such as lakes, rivers, and streams, while the remaining water comes from groundwater or wells. Every single day, Phoenix Water makes smart strategic decisions to ensure residents have a safe, uh, quality water supply for generations to come. So I want to thank the city of Phoenix. And finally, I want to thank EPCOR for uh, also sponsoring and engaging in this way. Uh, EPCOR started 125 years ago in Edmonton, Canada as the first municipality owned uh, electric utility and 10 years later as Edmonton's water utility. Today, EPCOR is one of the largest private utilities in the Southwest. EPCOR provides clean water, wastewater and drainage services and uh, also energy to more than 2 million customers in the U.S. and Canada. So thank you, Epcor. Uh, again, thank you to all our sponsors. Um, we have a great panel this morning. Um, these are the folks that we turn to if we want to uh, figure out, um, you know, what's going on uh, with water policy and what may be next for the state. Um, with us this morning is Stan Bushaski. Uh Tom is the director of the Arizona Department of Water Resources. Tom has more than 30 years of experience in water management. Um, he is responsible, of course, for management of the state's water supplies, including multiple planning and policy, regulatory and permitting programs dedicated to that mission. He also serves as Arizona's principal negotiator on matters relating to the Colorado River. Tom, thank you for joining us. Good morning, Luigi and fellow panelists. Glad to be here. Also with us is Ted Cook. Uh, Ted is the general manager of the Central Arizona Project. Previously, he served as deputy general manager, finance and administration, uh, responsible for finance, accounting, risk management, supply chain and facilities management, information technology, environmental compliance, health and safety, S, and as well as protective services. He joined uh, CAP in 1999. Uh, Ted, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Luigi. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Uh, also with us is Catherine Sorensen, uh, who is the director of Phoenix Water Services, uh, which means really she makes sure our drinking water is drinkable and safe. Catherine oversees a system that delivers drinking water to 1.5 million people, and she also manages Phoenix sewer collection system uh, and treats wa wastewater for 2.5 million residents here in the Valley. Catherine, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Um, Thomas Locum is the vice president of corporate services and general counsel uh, for EPCOR USA. As Vice President of Corporate Services, uh, Thomas has oversight for developing and guiding strategic goals and objectives that align with the company's long-term vision and growth within the United States. As General Manager, uh, General Counsel, sorry, as General Counsel, he is responsible for all legal matters involving EPCOR USA and its regulated and unregulated U.S. subsidiaries, including corporate and regulatory compliance, litigation, operational agreements, and of course, management of real property issues. Thomas, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, and finally, we have Dave Roberts. Uh, Dave is the Associate General Ma Manager, Water Resources for SRP. Uh, he has decades of experience in water resource management, water rights, water rights administration, and watershed management. He has been involved in resolving complex water resource issues, has worked with the federal government, the state, of course, Central Arizona Project in various cities, towns, <laughs> irrigation districts, mining companies, environmental organizations, developers, ranchers, and yes, farmers as well. Dave has also years of experience in water resource contract negotiations with Indian tribes and water resource entities and organization. Um, he entered at ADWR uh, uh, many moons ago um, and joined SRP in 1986. Dave, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Luigi, and good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, before we start, I want to play this. Um, um, I want to share with you um, and play this video uh, from EPCOR. I think it's very relevant to our conversation this morning. <laughs>
And of course, thank you for that video. I want to make sure that um, that video actually played. Did you guys, did you all see that? I did. There was no sound. No there was sound. no sound. All right. Um, let me try that again. Uh, my apologies for the technical difficulty, but let me uh, let me see if I can uh, share that again Don't. and. Works this time. One of the most important contributions we can make to slow the spread of COVID-19 is to wash our hands. It's such a simple act, yet it has become a frontline defense advocated by public health officials to maintain our livelihood and keep our communities safe. This simple act, of course, relies on an essential ingredient, access to clean water. There is no higher priority for EPCOR than protecting the health and safety of our customers and the communities we serve. Our dedicated employees will increase our already stringent water quality and safety protocols, testing systems daily, and adhering to strict federal and local guidelines. Our testing looks for microorganisms such as bacteria and viruses, as well as organic and inorganic contaminants and chemicals. This crisis has shown us that the value of clean water has never been higher. A steady and reliable water supply is essential to slow the spread of the novel coronavirus. Uh, were you able to actually hear the sound this time? Yeah. Yes. Oh, perfect. Yes. Awesome. All right. right. So I guess my first question is going to be to Thomas. Um, there's, uh, you know, early on there were fears that maybe COVID-19 actually is uh, something that you can perhaps get through our water system. I want you to, um, uh, I guess, assure us that that's not the case. It is not the case. It's been uh, looked at in a variety of different ways by a number of different people and uh, there's been absolutely no evidence of transmission uh, through our water system and this, the routine safety protocols, the advanced filtration and, uh, and treatment techniques that we use, that water utilities use across the country have made clear that there is no transmission of COVID through our water system. And, and Catherine, uh, uh, the same thing for you, right? If you can assure like the residents of and, and your oh. that this this is not this is not the case. You don't get it from our uh, water system. You don't get it from our water system. Um, all our methods for um, disinfection are more than adequate to deal with COVID nineteen. They are specifically designed uh, to keep people safe from viruses and bacteria. So yeah, it, the water is perfectly safe. And um, as the video mentioned, what's really important is that you use the water to wash your hands. That's one of the best ways to fight COVID nineteen. Uh, thank you, Catherine and Thomas. Um, I want to talk just real quick about the workforce. Um, you know, we have um, staff, your staffers, your workers um, in the water industry that are working uh, to ensure that, you know, we have a, a reliable water supply, but also that our water supplies are safe. How are they doing um, now that we have this pandemic? How are we ensuring that, first of all, they're safe? And I want to go to um, Dave to that, uh, for that question. Sure. Thank you, Luigi. Um, uh, one of the things that SRP uh, has done for many, many years is to deploy a crisis management team. And we actually uh, monitored what was going on throughout the world long before this hit the United States. And so that team was put in place early in January to be prepared for this. Um, and so we did prepare for it and began uh, designing sort of how uh, SRP would react to that, especially for our essential employees who either run our water control system or involved in delivering water in the field or obviously running our power plants because power is another essential service that's needed here in the Valley, obviously during the summer as well. Um, so we started a program with Arizona State University uh, for testing. So we have a very uh, extensive testing program for our employees, especially those who are uh, delivering water and delivering power as well. Um, and obviously using PPE, designing the protocols for the use of masks, washing your hands, physical distancing, things of that nature. And so far our employees have been able to, to manage through that and continue to deliver water in the field. 
uh, delivering water to the Valley cities and, and also ensuring that we can meet the power load here in the Valley as well. And uh, that's worked out very well. When we had those really hot days uh, a few weeks ago, we set records on the amount of power that we produced three days in a row over that one weekend. So our system is ready to go both on the water and the power side of the company. And Ted, what, uh, walk us through what happens if you have folks that you know, potentially get sick um, and, and test positive with COVID-19. How do you deal with that uh, scenario? And I ask the question because of course, you know, it's a very specialized, these are very specialized skills uh, that, that you need. And it's not, it's not like you can just go get somebody to replace that person. If that person, for example, gets sick for, you know, or gets quarantined for at least two weeks. That, that, that's right. And, and Luigi, you recognized in your earlier comments that the that the, uh, the paramount goal of delivering water is inextricably coupled to having a workforce that can do that, those two things. So that's what our focus has been, keep the employees safe, keep delivering the water. Um, so like SRP, we do have a business interruption plan that includes a pandemic response. Within three days, we were able to deploy uh, uh, our workforce about 50-50. Uh, the professionals and administrative people are, are working from home. And the field people and the water control people have to work in CAP facilities. So they're on a split shift. They're, they're uh, socially distanced from each other. Um, they have to wear masks uh, at work and, and, and so forth. Um, so we have developed pretty detailed protocols for a lot of scenarios. We can't identify every single one. So that in the event that an employee is experiencing symptoms or has been exposed or has received a positive test, what do we, what do, we do with them? Essential services like, like water providers do have, even under CDC guidelines, the ability to uh, uh, either quarantine folks uh, or in the event of uh, uh, limited uh, uh, labor skills, we can, if they're, if they're non-symptomatic, have them continue to report to work and monitor their symptoms. So, so far, those protocols have been very useful for us uh, that when a situation arises, we have basically a recipe that we can use, although we do have the flexibility to consider each individual circumstance as it, as it comes up to, again, keep the employees safe, keep the water flowing. Thank you, Ted. And Tom, you're preparing for probably one of the, um, uh, you know, one of the biggest negotiations that we're going to have here in, 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 you know, very soon. And that has to do with, well, you know, candidate water allocation, uh, from the uh, Colorado River. But even as you're doing that, you know, you still have other work that you need to do. And your department of, is, of course, in charge of things that would require a lot of field work. And I wonder how you're dealing with, you know, this uh, work that you need to, to do, the preparations that you, you, you know, you have to do, um, you know, amidst a global pandemic. Well, Luigi, uh, like others have spoken about, in terms of the protocols for wearing masks and social distancing, we're practicing that, but well over 80% of our workforce is teleworking. We've been setting up virtual meetings for various committees and other processes that need to go forward. So we're dealing with it that way. Um, most of the field work that we do is related to measuring uh, well levels around the state. And we've really cut back on doing that uh, but we have wells around the state that have telemetry so we can get information that way as well. So we are living in the virtual world. Uh, we've got great support out of the governor's office to maximize teleworking for our employees, keep them safe, keep getting our work done uh, on those issues that you talked about. T Tom, when you say you have telemetry, wh what do you mean by that exactly? So there's equipment on the wells that transmits the water level back to the department, essentially. So we can do that measurement remotely. That's very cool. Uh, let's talk about reconsultation. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll stick with you, uh, Tom, here. Um, what is reconsultation? Uh, who are the key players? Um, and what's the goal? So Reconsultation is actually a bit of a misnomer. So the way the process will work, come up with the guidelines for the Colorado River Management after 2026, 
is really a federal process that involves NEPA. Different alternatives will be analyzed in that NEPA process, and then the federal government will have a record of decision picking a preferred alternative. What we in here, Arizona would like to do with support from our stakeholders is potentially work with the other states in the Colorado Basin and Mexico and NGOs and tribes and a whole variety of stakeholders to try to come up with a proposed alternative that we can garner strong support for. We actually have a requirement under the 2007 guidelines for the seven basin states to work together to that end. Uh, we hope, again, to work something out with all of the stakeholders, but we'll be putting together a, an alternative among the states for how the river might be managed post-2026. And, and when you say an alternative, can you elaborate on that? So just like in our current management uh, paradigm, it will probably involve elevations in Lake Mead in which mandatory reductions occur. It will probably continue to incentivize the conservation of water stored in Lake Mead, things like that. It will probably continue to balance how Lake Powell and Lake Mead are managed. So many of the things that are already in place, we will look at whether they're working well and whether we want to carry them forward post 2026 and perhaps come up with some new ideas. And maybe one of the key elements will be a little bit more of an adaptive management approach so that if conditions don't play out the way we are projecting them from modeling, we can more easily change the management scheme pursuant to that adaptive management element of the plan. Which means that if we anticipated like need to drop by certain levels and it turned out that they dropped more or they dropped less, then uh, there is flexibility there within the existing plan. That's correct. So in 2007, we had the, the shortest guidelines and conjunctive management of Lake Powell and Lake Mead. And then in 2015, we came up with the drought contingency plan, which really was an adaptive management element to those 2007 guidelines, because we knew the guidelines were not doing enough. And, and Ted, let me ask you, what, so what, what kind of timeline are you looking at here? And in so far as the CAP, um, what is your interest? What do you want to see as we go through this uh, reconsultation process? Well, I think it's important to point out from the from the beginning that uh, ADWR and CWC are uh, again co-sponsoring, co-chairing the reconsultation process uh, within Arizona, at least at least part of it, uh, uh, with with the entire uh, stakeholder committee that we had for the DCP has been reassembled and rechristened the Arizona Reconsultation Committee. So we're working together on this, and CAP's goals are aligned. Uh, with, with ADWR's goals in this respect. Um, uh, as Tom mentioned, the reconsultation will differ from the DCP, which is our most recent experience. The DCP in Arizona was an implementation plan. Uh, and and it, it was an intense effort, but it was over a relatively short period of time, that's several months. The reconsultation will take probably all of the time that we have between now and 2026 when the current guidelines expire. And primarily that's because of the NEPA process that even with the streamlining that the federal government is trying to implement on NEPA, it still takes a long time. It will take, it will take time to develop these uh, alternatives and select one as, as, Tom, as Tom mentioned. Uh, DCP was putting something on top of the 2007 guidelines that already exist. This will be designing something from, from scratch. It will require congressional uh, authorization at the end. It will require, at least in Arizona, uh, state legislation to get that done. So it will, take, it will take several years to get that done. Our goals in the near term, again, are to, we're starting ahead of time. In 2020, the United States, the Bureau of Reclamation is um, uh, concentrating on its mandatory review of the effectiveness of the 2007 guidelines. It's called the 7D review. Uh, they will take uh, most of this year to do that. At some point in 2021, we expect uh, Reclamation to formally start the, its reconsultation process. We've already begun in Arizona. Uh, Tom and I reconvened at the Arizona Reconsultation Committee a couple of weeks ago with the first meeting to kind of set the stage. We'll have another meeting later on. Uh, the parties in the Basin States have already begun to, to work with each other, preparing 
for this process going forward. So for right now, our goal is an inclusive process, transparency, providing a lot of information so that when the Bureau of Reclamation says go, we're ready to, to respond and, and be involved. And let me go to Catherine. Catherine, um, I am assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming you are definitely part of this process. You're, you're part of the, uh, you know, the DCP steering committee before and, 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 and now you're, you know, it's, I think it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's everybody with, that participated in the DCP process. We you know, are also participating in this new uh, reconsultation process as well. But in so far as the city of Phoenix, what do you want to see in this reconsultation? Right. So, of course, uh, the water that we uh, receive here in central Arizona from the Colorado River system is lower in priority than the, um, the water that um, Yuma and California and Nevada and others enjoy. And so, of course, that's a concern for us uh, looking into the future where we see an over allocated river, um, where we see that climate change may actually exacerbate that problem. So our focus um, in terms of reconsultation and what comes after uh, 2026 is on enhancing the reliability of those supplies. And in our perspective, the, the best way uh, to enhance the reliability of Colorado River water supplies here in Central Arizona is to address the over allocation of the river. Um, there's a lot of tools that we can use to en enhance um, uh, the Colorado River deliveries to provide some flexibility. Um, you know, intentionally created surplus is one of those. Um, there are other agreements that we can enter into that kind of um, provide additional reliability. But at the end of the day, if the Colorado River system is over allocated, our supplies are more at risk. And so we really want to address that issue head on. The best way that we see that happening is through system conservation. Um, system conservation is essentially a way to uh, keep additional water in Lake Mead. It doesn't belong to anybody. And it's one of the best ways to directly address the over allocation of the Colorado River. So we're and, when you, um, and when you say you're a little lower than the other interests, that means that they have priority. Right? So as the water in the Lake Mead goes down, there's less water to allocate, uh, you know, they're prioritized and at some point, you know, the water will get to you. That's, that's correct. So um, when shortage is declared, um, our water is essentially, here in, Air, in central Arizona, is essentially first to be cut. Um, and so that's obviously a, a big issue for us. Um, and that's why we want to be sure that we're addressing the issue of over allocation directly. And, and Thomas, it, I guess the same question for you, sir. Uh, for, for, you know, uh, uh, Utilities such as EPCOR, what is your interest in this reconsultation process? You know, I'd say our interest is at this stage, at least, when everyone's still identifying the key issues that they, they want to accomplish. I see more of a higher level strategic focus for us, which is we want, you know, resilient and reliable supply. We want um, a sustainable framework that everyone buys into uh, that's flexible. Uh, and also it's based on the actual math and actual science, what we know now. So there are no sudden changes. Uh, our customers aren't going to experience any um, significant declines in, or, or severe cuts. Um, I want everyone to know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen and why it's going to happen. And I think we're headed there. Um, it's a shared burden. It's a shared effort by us and all the other states uh, in the area. And um, I'm excited for it. Uh, and Dave, um, the same question, sir. Uh, in so far as SRP, you know, you deliver both power and, and water, of course. Um, but what do you want to see in this reconsultation process? Well, uh, I, I would like to just uh, comment and emphasize what Tom, uh, Tom Bischofsky said about the adaptability of the program as it goes forward. Um, I think it's very, very important that people understand that uh, this is a, a process that's covered under federal regulatory laws like NEPA and ESA. And it's important that we, when we develop this new plan, that it be flexible and adaptable so that you don't have to go back and reconsult uh, with NEPA or ESA compliance, things of that nature as you go forward. So mm -hmm. it needs to be a plan that has flexibility, it has adaptability to it, uh, because we don't wanna repeat this every four or five years. We wanna mm -hmm. have a long-term plan that's flexible 
Um, and I think that uh, that's, that's certainly uh, something that Arizona would be interested in. If you've ever had to deal with NEPA or ESA, that's what you want in some fashion, being able to have an adaptable plan so you don't have to go back and deal with those federal regulations, which, you know, the Colorado River is regulated by those, those rules. So that's important. And SRP will play a role. Certainly we have an interconnection facility with CAP right now and we can share water supplies. We have an interest in constructing another facility that would allow for more integration of our supplies and potentially help with um, Colorado River matters as we go forward. Tom, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ted. Yes, I just, I just wanted to point one thing out real quick, if you don't mind. We've heard some important, I think, comments from all of the panelists here about, um, about what we'd like to see out of, out of the reconsultation of flexibility, um, conservation, dealing with the impacts of climate change and a, uh, a, a less um, a bountiful supply of Colorado River water going forward. And so I would like to also reflect on something that Tom said, like the adaptability and the adaptability, not only to avoid having to redo things every, every couple of years, but to, to deal with those things. But the, the main purpose of the reconsultation from my point of view, because it will culminate in a record of a decision by the Secretary of the Interior and action by Congress, is rather than having the federal government impose an outcome on everybody, and says that there's less water, so you all get these cuts, is to have something that we all, as Thomas said, that we all can agree to and that we all can support, and that also is flexible, that will deal with those issues of climate change and a lower supply, but will be adaptable so that in, when there is more supply available, that we have, have that supply available to us, and, and when there's less in the lake full, we cut back. And as Tom mentioned, the, the interactive management of the major reservoirs, all of those elements will be in place to allow us to have a program that we can all agree to and that we can support and we can predict what's going to happen under certain conditions rather than, again, having someone from the outside come in and tell us this is what is going to happen to you. Uh, this uh, that, we will, that we will voluntarily, at least at first, voluntarily identify, here's our plan, can everybody get on board and then have the Bureau of Reclamation ad adopt that as the plan. So, so Tom, you know, we are facing a drier climate. Uh, we're facing, uh, you know, by all indications, you know, uh, less water in the Colorado River. Um, should people go into this reconcil reconsultation process with the expectation that there's going to be, you know, less water for people and therefore that means really cuts for people? Well, Luigi, again, it depends on what the situation is. And as we uh, put the plan together that we're living under now, there are cuts for different entities, and Catherine described the priority system a little bit, when the lake gets to certain levels. Likewise, when the lake raises back to uh, more healthy levels, surplus levels, we'll be able to even potentially to use more water. So it really is about having a plan that takes advantage of the opportunities given by the conditions on the river, the hydrology and the uh, capacities and how much water is actually in the reservoirs. So to say there'll be permanent cuts forever that we will live with out into the future doesn't make a lot of sense because there's just project projections as well for uh, surplus water to yet again exist on the Colorado River and one of the impacts of climate change the acceleration of the hydrologic cycle is you could potentially get more high flow events. The extremes will get bigger. The droughts will get bigger and longer. The extremes might get bigger as well. And some of that planning is going to be part of what we look at for the reconsultation. So um, I want to talk about, uh, you know, uh, conservation and, you know, augmentation. You know, 10 years ago, um, when if people mentioned desalination as a potential solution to our water ongoing water problems, you know, it's probably a bit out there, right? Because it's the infrastructure is going to be expensive. Uh, it takes a lot of planning. Um, but what about now? What about the idea of, you know, I guess I'm going to ask Ted, what do you make of the idea of desalination as being something that we should really consider? Well, um, Yes, while well, for a long time, the major impediment, I think, to uh, large-scale desalination has been the cost. But for a, 
a scarce commodity and, and becoming scarcer commodity like water in our arid region, uh, at, at some point uh, the, the, the market forces will, will take care of, of the cost. When you don't have a commodity, then the amount that you're willing to pay will, will increase. Um, but contrary to a lot of public opinion, that uh, there has been a lot of work going on uh, on desalination, both uh, the ocean and also local uh, brackish groundwater supply desalination. All of the farming that has gone on in Arizona for a long time has resulted in uh, briny aquifers that are right here that, uh, that can also be desalinated. Um, I would actually like to pass the baton to Tom and ask him to comment a little bit uh, where, where our, our primary effort from an Arizona State uh, perspective on, on uh, ocean desalination has been through conversations with Mexico uh, and, uh, and the, the minutes to the treaty with, between Mexico and the United States. Tom, go ahead, sir. So, Luigi, uh, if folks can look at the U.S. International Boundary and Water Commission website. There is a report published there maybe a couple months old, uh, that looks at opportunities in the Sea of Cortez for binational value in terms of desalination. Uh, that report was a couple of years in the making. Uh, it was funded by SRP, DWR, CAP, uh, and Freeport Macaran here in Arizona and some other folks in California and Nevada, along with Mexico. And so, there's a lot of steps to be taken to move forward with that report or actually implementing that report. Uh, the cost, I think, to deliver that water on a per acre foot basis is somewhere around $2,000 to almost $2,300 uh, a year per, uh, per acre foot. Uh, and it would really be exchanged is the concept right now uh, for Mexico's water down uh, in the Yuma area, Morelos Stam, et cetera. So that opportunity is there. We've done a lot of work, a lot of work yet needs to be done, uh, but that is a potential for a couple hundred thousand acre feet a year of desalinated water. And again, internally in the state, Ted mentioned brackish groundwater through the Governor's Water Augmentation Innovation and uh, Conservation Committee. There's a committee called the Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee. They're looking at those opportunities for desalination of that brackish water. And there are a lot of legal and technical issues that are being worked on uh, before that could become a reality. Um, Catherine, uh, you know, the city of Phoenix has been uh, uh, pumping water uh, back into the ground and storing, banking, storing water. Uh, where are we in terms of our ability to actually extract those water back and, 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 you know, and, and, and supply them? Right. I'm, I'm glad you asked that um, because that is an interesting story here in Arizona. We were um, very uh, early pioneers in the storage of water under um, our aquifers, uh, in our aquifers, and that's uh, a really great thing. Um, and we did that for the most part, if you look back 30 years ago, we did that really in an effort to make full use of our, our Colorado River entitlement and to keep it away from California. And we were at that time very focused on just socking that groundwater, that, that Colorado River water away in our local aquifers, knowing that there would come a time in the future when we would um, need that water. So our historic focus was on storage um, and less so on how we get that water back out of the ground. But here we are, you know, 30 odd years later and we're facing the potential of shortage on the Colorado River in the next several years. Um, we really do need to turn our focus to how we get that stored water back out of the ground. Um, there is a process that is being led through DWR in partnership with the uh, cities and other water users and the CAWCD to take a look at how recovery might work. Um, but individual utilities look at that as well. So, for example, here in the city of Phoenix, um, we in, uh, about 40 years ago, we intentionally... Uh, started pumping less groundwater out of our fossil aquifers and started turning to the use of renewable surface water supplies through our surface water treatment plants. And that was intentional because we wanted to save those fossil groundwater supplies for the future. 
And that entailed a really huge investment of hundreds of millions of dollars in the infrastructure necessary to use surface water supplies. Um, and we're really proud of that. But over the course of those many decades, we also lost a lot of our groundwater pumping capacity. And so now with shortage um, a, a potential in the next several years, we're trying to rebuild that capacity. Uh, so we are drilling additional wells. Uh, and we're also uh, partnering with other entities that can pump groundwater out of aquifers on our behalf. So I'm sure you've heard, for example, of our exchange with the city of Tucson. Essentially, we store some of our Colorado River water down in Tucson's aquifers. Tucson, unlike Phoenix, is, um, has a huge well field. Um, they basically recharge all of their water and then pump it back out of their wells. So by partnering with Tucson and storing our water there, uh, we can ask them to recover that water on our behalf and then send uh, their Colorado River uh, surface water to City of Phoenix surface water treatment plants in exchange when we need it. So we're looking at a, a bunch of different mechanisms uh, that will all be necessary, exchanges, uh, direct recovery, indirect recovery, to make sure that when the time comes, we can pull that water back out of the ground. Um, thank you, Catherine. Thomas, um, you know, there's one idea, uh, you know, that's uh, persistent, persistently been talked about, which is to uh, modify people's behavior uh, through economics, right? So if you price your water a little bit higher to conserve water, then, you know, people will, in theory, less, uh, use less water. I, I wonder what you make of that option. I ask the question, of course, because you're, you know, supply water to residents. You know, it's an interesting question. It's something that's been front of mind for us uh, quite a bit. Uh, right now, actually, we do that uh, through rate design, which we, over certain tiers of usage, the water gets increasingly more expensive. Uh, and that's been a policy of the Arizona Corporation Commission. Uh, and I think it's been pretty successful. And of course, we don't set our own rates. Uh, the ACC does. Um, but I also have to note, I mean, it's, it's a fairly political process, uh, or at least a highly volatile process, because folks don't want to pay much for their water. It's an essential service and they um, they want to pay a reasonable price. We're committed to that. And so we, we right now focus our efforts on education, on helping customers detect leaks. I mean, we'll send people out and walk around uh, our customers' property with them to identify leaks or, or teach them or send out water conservation kits. Um, but in terms of pricing itself, that's a conversation that involves a, a lot of different stakeholders. Um, it is uh, perennial, but um, also always unresolved. And, Luigi, and, could I jump yeah. in there real quick? Yeah, just real quick, yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, so I wanted to comment on that because it is really important. Um, our ability to provide safe, clean, reliable water supplies is entirely dependent on the condition of our infrastructure. And uh, the infrastructure necessary to do that is it's massive and it's extremely expensive. And it's really important that as a community, we have the political will to continue to invest in that infrastructure. Um, although Phoenix and, and Arizona, you know, we, we tend to think of ourselves as, as, as young compared to some of the East Coast cities and, and other regions of the country, we are not young. We are middle-aged at best. And we have to continue to reinvest in this infrastructure if we're gonna continue to have reliable supplies. And political will to increase water rates, community will to pay for that is of paramount importance. That's, that's exactly right, Catherine. In the last couple years, we replaced a well in our Sun City district that was from the Depression era. And I mean, and that's expensive. And we need to do that for safe water, for reliable water, and it, it costs money. And we do everything we can to make sure that those are reasonable investments and expenditures. But in the end, they are still expenditures. And Dave, let me, let me, let me go to you, sir. What, you know, the idea of using economics to modify, modify people's behaviors, right? What, what do you make of that? You know, having heard Catherine, having heard Thomas about uh, just the cost of, first of all, just making sure we have no leaks, right? And plugging those leaks and maybe changing some of those systems. I mean, they're, they're tremendous costs. Um, yes, there are tremendous costs there. I, you know, we have to balance, uh, we have to balance the, uh, the, the investment in infrastructure with affordability as well. So you have to sort of look at it on both sides. But I would agree with, uh, with both 
Thomas and Catherine about the infrastructure. I think it, uh, it's, it's critical that in order to provide the safe, reliable, clean and resilient water supply, you need, uh, you need a, a, a good set of infrastructure to capture that water, put it to use, uh, deliver it to, uh, to consumers as well. And I would say the first line of infrastructure that we have to really think about is the green infrastructure of our watersheds. Um, that's, that's where our water comes from. And it's important for us to invest in that infrastructure. You know, we just had this huge bushfire just north of northwest or northeast of Phoenix here. Uh, half of that fire uh, will, will uh, end up with water supplies coming in below our reservoirs. And so that's going to be a tricky issue for us to deal with from a clean and reliable water supply with respect to what the runoff is from that area. But I would agree with them that the infrastructure is important. We have to invest in it. Uh, we have to have, find ways to, to make it financially uh, feasible for folks as well. That's where the Bureau of Reclamation and the federal government can come in and be involved in helping us with that. Uh, they, they can offer long-term investment opportunities for us. And so we need to look at those types of, of things to invest in our infrastructure and also make it affordable for our consumers. Um, Tom, um, I want to go back to the reconsultation process just real quick and, and, and more specifically the timeline. When, do you, uh, when does this process end and when does the legislature have to come in and uh, approve uh, whatever uh, the uh, final product, well, you know, the, whatever we come up with in the state? So since the federal government has not launched the process yet, we don't know exactly, but we've tried to estimate. So we probably have to have the final record of decision in place and ready to go maybe in May of 2026. We are likely to need federal legislation. So we are kind of planning for two sessions in Congress. Uh, that would be about the same time that state legislation might be needed. So 2025, 20, early 2026. Um, in terms of alternatives, Ted and I are estimating maybe we need an alternative among the states and others somewhere around uh, the end of 2023. So in on our website and on CAP's website, you can find pages related to the reconsultation. There are slides of our presentation from the last meeting. We have a specific slide where we try to estimate the time frame if you want more detail. Um let me go to some of the, uh, the, the viewers and the, and the listeners' questions real quick. So um, um, a lot of the questions have, uh, deal with uh, AMA areas and ANA areas. Like, and I think many of the questions are asking whether we need to expand, uh, first of all, the AMA areas. Um, let me go to, uh, I guess, let me go to Tom for the questions here. Uh, uh, what role are we potentially considering expanding AMA areas in this, even in this reconsultation process. That's kind of part Again, of Again, in the Governor's Council, Luigi, that I mentioned earlier, there's a non-AMA groundwater committee. It is looking at issues like how do we manage groundwater outside the AMAs. It's looking at potential issues related to irrigation, non-expansion areas, the INA thing that you uh, refer to. But I will tell you, it is... Uh, there are many lively debates about those issues. Those folks in those areas don't have alternative water supplies uh, like we do in the active management areas. Um, the idea of expanding AMAs and, and or changing the requirements for an irrigation non-expansion area, have been discussed for many, many years. Uh, what we hope to create through that committee of the council is to come some, to some level of consensus where we can have the public support to make these things happen. Because without it, the legislative changes we potentially need to make it happen are not going to happen. So I would encourage folks to follow that process. Again, you go to uh, azwater.gov. We have web pages where you can follow along with that process. Those meetings are all open to the public. Obviously, lately they've been virtual. But that is where we build the consensus to best figure out how we are going to manage those areas outside of the AMAs where groundwater is essentially their only water supply. Here's another question. Uh, I am a winemaker working with vineyards in uh, Santa Cruz County uh, and in Wilcox uh, in Cochise County. Uh, what efforts are being made in both of these two regions to mitigate water loss in aquifers, ensuring 
the future of the small farmers are the foundation of the Arizona wine industry. Um, anybody, Ted, maybe you want to take a crack at this question, sir? Sorry, could you, could you repeat that for me? Yeah, so the question is, uh, what efforts are being made in uh, uh, Cochise and Santa Cruz counties uh, to mitigate water loss in aquifers to ensure that the future, uh, uh, you know, to ins ensuring the future of the small farmers, and by small farmers, they mean the, the, the vineyards, the winemakers, um, that are, you know, we, we do have a, you know, a thriving, starting thriving wine industry in Arizona. Yeah, well, actually, Luigi, I'm sorry to say this, but you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> okay, all right. All right. That's, 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 that's my opinion, but, but I shouldn't be addressing it. It's outside my service area. All right, no worries. Really Luigi, really in the Santa play. Cruz area, we are working on the fourth management plan for that active management area, which will be done by the end of this year. There is a AMA-wide process for the fifth management plan, which will be the next set of plans. Santa Cruz will be involved in that. In the Wilcox area in 2014 and 15, there was a grassroots effort to put together some new kind of management area potentially uh, through making legislative changes. It involved winemaker representatives, farmers, ranchers, uh, private homeowners, uh, but they could not come to a consensus on a plan, but it was very heavily conservation-based and incentivizing conservation. Uh, there was draft legislation floating around, but it never got introduced at the legislature. Um, th th thank, thank you, Tom. And Dave, you were gonna, th did you say something there in the middle? Yeah, I, I was gonna say that it's really a question for Tom, but one, you know, one of the things that certainly needs to be looked at down there is sharing of water supplies among maybe the, the, the farmer dairy producers and those who are producing, uh, or making vineyards and making wine and somehow to share those water supplies. Perhaps a dairyman can work with a winemaker and uh, they can share in those supplies and uh, make it as sort of a new marketing uh, scheme for them as well. So I think, I think they're going to need to sort of share in supplies more than anything else because I, I, I doubt that augmentation of that area is going to come about anytime soon. So it's a matter of them all working together. I've got a couple so Dave, of questions. The, the grassroots concept, Dave, uh, in Wilcox was just what you were talking about. And again, it was uh, a very lively debate, in some cases, pitting family against family uh, in that Wilcox area. And again, no consensus really came about as a result of that process. Um, many of the questions have to deal with uh, farmlands and the, uh, the fear that they may be drawing water from our groundwaters and, you know, which have resulted in, or at least people are saying resulted in, uh, maybe the, you know, the uh, water levels for wells, uh, uh, maybe some of them are, you know, have to dig deeper as a result. Uh, a lot of the questions um, also, uh, quite frankly, are specific to the issues in Cochise County. I guess it's a question for Tom. So again, I think the poster children right now are Cochise County, Mojave County, La Paz County. Uh, we just talked about Wilcox, and that was part and parcel of that, that issue. Uh, there was an attempt in the San Simone subbasin in the Wilcox area to create an irrigation non-expansion area under the process of the law, which allowed landowners to petition the director. Uh, that was around 2015 or 16. I can't remember the exact date, but that petition was turned down. It didn't meet the requirements of the law. And one of the reasons it didn't is because it, under the law, it is difficult to project out how future pumping might play into the drawdown of the aquifers. It's really about the pumping at the current rates. And there are discussions about changing that law, but again, if that's not happened. In Mojave and La Paz counties, there's processes underway. I mentioned the governor's council already. There's also two legislatively created committees, one in Mojave County and one in Cochise County that are charged with reporting back to the legislature by 12-31-2021 on those very issues. Um, one of the questions we got has to deal with the fact that we are a growth state, right? So I'm, I wanna pose this question to both Thomas and Catherine. But, you know, it, it, we, we are, uh, remain to be even during the, you know, this time, even during the recession of the last decade, you know, we are definitely a top growth state and therefore we're attracting more people. How do you balance attracting people, uh, you know, potentially exploding population, 
at the same time ensuring that uh, you know the water supply is affordable but also reliable. Ka Catherine? Sure, so I mean, first off, you start with smart water management, methodical planning for the future. And that's something that we've uh, done here in Arizona for many decades and that we're really good at. Um, we are good planners out of necessity um, when it comes to water resources. But um, also I would say it's important to note that for the most part, we have decoupled population growth with water use. So if you look at the city of Phoenix, if you look broadly at the state of Arizona, we've been able to grow our population and at the same time um, diminish our per capita water use. And um, so in, in the city of Phoenix example, uh, we deliver less water in total today than we did 20 years ago, but we've added more than 400,000 people to our service area. So um, I know that people like to tie population growth with water use, but that just really isn't necessarily the case looking forward into the future. I know many people want water to be a limiting factor for growth here in Arizona, but I don't think it will be. Um, I think as long as we continue to innovate, as long as we continue to conserve, as long as we continue to plan methodically for the future, I don't see that on the horizon. Catherine, what you're saying is that even as the state's population exploded, especially in the metro areas, water uses relatively remain flat. That's what you're yep. saying, correct? Uh, yeah. uh, 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 Thomas, the same question, sir. Well, and I think what Catherine is talking about is the result of that planning. And, and that's what popped to my mind when you asked the question is that we plan for a living. That's what we do. We carefully and methodically plan each and every step uh, at various different time horizons. Uh, we install top-notch infrastructure. We maintain it. We repair it. We replace it when we need to. So leakage goes down. Uh, we are very strong on educating our customers on how to be thoughtful with water use and conservation. Um, we store and otherwise reuse reclaim, uh, reclaimed water. And just from top to bottom, every aspect of our organization is designed to uh, make sure that we have a long-term robust water supply. It's, it's our primary focus. And, uh, and I think we're doing really well. And, and I know the city of Phoenix is as well. It's good to uh, get confirmation that even as the population is growing, uh, our you know, residential water use is, is relatively flat. It means we're, we're doing what needs to be done. I do want to go to Dave. What else can residents do? What else can folks like me do to really conserve water to make sure that you know, we're, you know, we're not wasting any drop? Well, obviously, the, uh, many of the cities have implemented plans to uh, help their residents conserve water. SRP has joined in that effort as well through AMWA and other types of programs and with CAP. Um, you know, most of the water use is, uh, that's consumed by residents is outdoor water use and, and certainly uh, taking care of your irrigation systems, taking care of your uh, water delivery systems or your outdoor, outdoor water use would be a, a high priority. One area that uh, certainly needs to be looked at is how homeowner association and, and those types of uh, uh, amenities around residential developments, how they manage their water supplies. I think it's an effort that can be looked at further to help conserve water. Um, and as, as Catherine said, um, we've actually been able to um, do a good job of that over the past 20, 25 years. And it's been reflected in a lot of the data uh, that you see at the Department of Water Resources for the Phoenix AMA towards achieving safe yield. And, and unlike many, some that have been mentioning that we're uh, in dire straits, I think we, we have made good progress towards reaching safe yield in the Phoenix AMA. And I think uh, it's a bright future with respect to uh, achieving that goal going forward. So uh, I, th I think the residents have done a good job, and I, but I think there's more to do as well. Um, we, I'm sorry, did, oh, okay. So um, I think we are pretty much out of time. I really wanna thank all of you for spending the morning with us. I, you know, I'm a reporter, so I'm, I'm just learning a lot. Uh, and I've learned a lot from this morning. Uh, Tom, uh, thank you. Thomas, thank you. Catherine, thank you. Uh, Ted, thank you. And Dave, thank you. Um, you enjoy the rest of your uh, day, the rest of your week. Uh, stay safe out there and uh, I'll see you around. Thank you, Luigi. Thanks. Yeah. And to our viewers and our to our listeners, thank you again for spending this morning with us. Uh, likewise to you. Have a good day, and uh, I'll see you.